great. So we've got colleagues here from Ghana and colleagues from Congo. Uh, please share where you're joining us from today in the chat. Oh, of course, and Kenya. South Africa. Many roads, people. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for your support, colleagues. Yes, you've Quite got on. your fans there, Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> and my colleagues, Roxana and Neil. And Neil, I might um, ask you to butt in at some point. Awesome. Noduma, I haven't heard you yet. Do you want to test your mic? Hi, Nicola. Hi, everyone. Hi, Noduma. Mm -hmm. How's Accra today? Hello. Accra is good. Hello. Weather is good. Hello. Great. Okay, I'm, I can hear somebody saying hello, hello. Can... Yeah, we're just going to mute folks um, who are not presenting. So please, if you please mute yourselves and we'll have some opportunities for you to share your voice later. But for now, please share where you're joining us from in the chat. Hello. Hello. Hi, good Tema. We hear you, but we're going to be asking people to please mute their microphones. And we're going to be getting sta uh, started shortly. Thank you. All right, we're one minute away from one o'clock and we've got colleagues from South Africa, Zimbabwe, Congo, Kenya, Ghana, um, and I'm sure many will be joining us soon. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. Irene is going to be facilitating for us Wow, and Ethiopia. Um, in, in the chat, uh, she's got some construction happening on her side. Um, so we're going to be sort of helping out with the facilitation. Um, we're still going to start by uh, introducing ourselves. Welcome, Tony, as well. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah, we'll get started on the hour. There we go. One o'clock. I'm going to hand over to Noduma to introduce herself first. Good afternoon from Accra, Ghana. My name is Anotu Mohlamini. I work for the Association of African Universities as the Director of ICT Services and Communications. Uh, originally, I'm from Zimbabwe. Uh, and I'm also happy to be here and welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Noduma. Karen, over to you. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, hello, everyone. Okay, my name is Karen Ferreira Meyers. I live and work, well, I work at the University of Eswatini in the Institute of Distance Education. Um, and I'm very pleased to be with you. I am the coordinator linguistics and modern languages, but I've been um, involved in uh, policy review and policy development uh, within the university for quite some time now and I'm really happy to be here with all of you. And Nicola, now it's your turn. 
Thank you, Karen. I'm Dr. Nicola Pallett and I'm based at Rhodes University. I'll just put on my camera shortly to say hi. Um, yeah, based at Rhodes University where I work in the educational technology team that's part of CHIRTL, the Center for Higher Education Research, Teaching and Learning. And we, um, we're based in Makanda uh, or Grahamstown in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. I'm a policy newbie, um, but I did help um, my colleague Neil, who's here as well, and our HRD work together with our quality unit. And we're gonna tell you a little bit more about that. All right, and I think I'm going to hand back to you, Karen. Uh, you can change slides, uh, Irene, please. Karen, I'm not hearing you. Karen did mention she's having some connectivity troubles. Um, maybe I can hand over for uh, to Noduma for this to get us started. Okay. Uh, while we wait for Karen, I'll just uh, begin. Everyone, you are most welcome. Um, I think we all agree that uh, policies in African universities or educational institutions are extremely important. And in this webinar, we would be looking at a specific type of policy, but uh, just briefly a reflection on what is policy. So policies are basically those documents or written statements that articulate the position of an institution pertaining a particular area. So a policy normally has a scope in terms of its focus. It also has uh, definitions. It also articulates uh, rules a code of conduct and in in general it is the role uh, of of a university to define these uh, policies and work together with stakeholders in 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 in, in order to define them so uh, the, there are different policies in terms of scope but there's an agreement that it's generally a document, a written or official statement. Maybe to start us off, I thought we could also find out uh, from the chat pertaining your experiences with policy, especially those that have been involved in a policy formulation. So if you could please share in the chat uh, your experiences. Have you been involved in policy formulation or are you new in policy formulation? I think that would help us uh, a lot in terms of understanding the audience that we have here today. I, I see Karen has joined us. Karen, are you are you able to jump in? Yes, yes, yes. I my connection just went. Thank you, Noduma, okay. for, for, for starting us off. I don't know if you've spoken to the issue of what policy basically is, but um, a policy can uh, occur in different environments, and we are now today looking at the blended or an online policy. But um, there is therefore a general agreement that any policy related to the university environment is a written or official statement of principle that explicitly articulates the position of the university on a particular matter. Yeah, so I think uh, 
Nodumo has already asked you to share with us if your university has already a policy on blended or, e uh, or online or e-learning and if you do and it is publicly available can you then please share you know your link uh, with us so that we can all benefit from what is in existence right i think we want to look briefly um at how at what the life cycle is of a policy and we're going to do that in the next slide uh, irene if you can bring us to the next slide so in general you know there's there's an idea that a university is toying with uh, it can be related to anything an outside factor or an internal factor and then a draft uh, is formulated it is then circulated uh, in general, it's a top-down approach, but it could also be the other way around. But various stakeholders are involved. Once the draft has been seen by everybody, uh, discussion has happened, comments have been made, then the draft can be approved and it then goes um, into implementation. Of course, issues arise when we implement and we will talk about that a little bit later. They arise, the issues, we monitor and evaluate what is implemented, what is not implemented, why this is happening, and then we can review and start all over again. So it's a circular type of setup. Uh, and I think that's important for us to think about. Um, and I would like maybe um, Nicola to come in and tell us a bit on what is the purpose of a policy? Why do we have a policy? What purpose does it serve? Yeah, sure, Karen. So I think these are linked quite nicely. Um, for many, you see, you know, some people see policy as policing or encouraging a particular behavior, what you'd like people to do. Um, but the real purpose, I mean, in many contexts, the intention is actually to guide good practice. And to be I think lead toward quality enhancement or depending on the purpose of the of the policy it's about guiding people um, and I think they one of the uh, things it's not necessary it, it's there's always this tension between enforcing and guiding um, policy should also respond uh, to the current environment um, and offer people some some kind of you know, guidance, their particular principles that are, you know, under underscored by, by policy. And I think it's to create a shared and, you know, communicate a uh, common language for people to understand um, particular things, whether this be in relation to assessment, whether it be around acceptable use of, you know, ICTs at a university. Um, and today we're going to be talking about, you know, blended and online um, learning policies in particular. Um, yeah, I think it's not intended to restrict people. Um, and sometimes it is perceived as such. Uh, it can also, it is also sometimes perceived as a solution to technology adoption uh, or integration where that is perhaps lacking at a university. So policy is not really a once off solution um to all challenges and i think sometimes we have the unrealistic expectation that it is um Noduma, maybe you can add some of your thoughts thank you very much um i i think a, a policy also allows us to move together uh, as an institution um during the times when I've been involved in policy formulation, it has also allowed us to reflect where we are going and also create that uh, important buy-in. Um, so it's, it's not all about rules, regulations, but about uh, engagement. I think for me, the engagement uh, part is the most important. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Over yeah, to you, Karen. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Nodumo. I can see that uh, Tony in the in the chat is is saying that uh, policy can be seen as an enabling 
um, a coherent organizational response. Um, of course, that might constrain experimentation and diversity. Yeah, because we're trying to harmonize a view, we're trying to get maybe some form of majority view. So yeah, there they are def definitely um, issues relating to, to getting a common, common understanding of a purpose of a specific uh, policy, and, and there are always related misconceptions. Now, an important question, I think, is for us to think whether um, the policies that we have, those that are already in existence, whether they were uh, brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Has the pandemic had um, made, made you change something? Has it brought uh, a sense of urgency when it comes to, to policy development? And again, I would like to you know, say that if there's anything that you can do in um, that you want to contribute in the chat, please go, go, go ahead. Um, Nicola is also saying that a policy, um, if it is sold as something that is too rigid, uh, then it might give us, it might cause issues. Uh, it should be something that is responsive and flexible. And that's why, you know, that circular approach is, I think, a very good one. Right, so any, any responses with regard to policy and the COVID-19 situation? I think both uh, Nicola and myself will be talking a little bit about what happened in our uh, own institutions a little bit later. Uh, and, and Noduma will be able to give us an idea of how uh, things were happening around the African uh, continent. Um, there is a question, and I'm going to ask all of us to think about this, uh, think about it. What is the drawback of a blended learning policy? And how can we overcome that drawback? Um, Gutema, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand your question. So maybe you want to qualify that a little bit uh, while, we, while we continue. So also, if in the chat, you can just um, give us some pointers on whether your blended or e-learning or online learning policy was developed before the pandemic hit us or it is something really, really recent. And while you are all thinking about that, um, Irene, we can go to the next slide. And uh, Nicola, you, can you maybe just give us a, a little bit of an idea of what we should find? What are um, the sections? What are the parts? What are the elements that we should find in blended and online learning policies? Um, yes, sure. And I think well, Gutierrez is also writing in the chat, um, but just to respond, there's a drawback. I think it's so contextual. It really depends on what a policy is advocating or encouraging and then how it is being encouraged. Is it being, is it again, is it sort of sold for, as something that is flexible or is it, um, you know, very rigid? So going back to, yes, Karen, your point about the, what should a policy um, contain? I think it's also um, very much policies always have these general things like a policy statement and there's things like objectives. So why did this policy come about? What is its purpose? Um, who is it for? Um, if any relevant uh, legislation, um, perhaps at national level. So for example, in South Africa, um, one of the legis uh, sort of rules for, from our Department of Higher Education and Training is that not more than 70% of undergraduate teaching, um, well, 70% has to be face-to-face. -face. Uh, of course, with COVID, um, things had changed and they, I think, allowed, you know, <laughs> that rule to be, um, you know, not, not to, be, to be overturned given, given the, given the uh, crisis. Other things are policy definitions. So some universities are using hybrid learning. Um, they, you know, in, in, I don't think it's, it's very common in the, what I've seen in Af other African universities. Don't, people don't really use the word hybrid. They'll talk more about blended. 
Um, sometimes you might decide you want to use, like UCT has online education. Um, they use it as a more broader uh, encompassing term. So those definitions are actually quite important going back, yes, indeed. So as Karen mentions, um, that all the stakeholders have a common language. Uh, Nodumo, you want to add to what uh, such policy, policy should contain? Um, I, I think uh, you've covered most of it, uh, Karen and Nicola. But um, I, I think it's also important to understand uh, the duration of the policy, uh, how it will be reviewed and revised, and also in terms of the custodianship. Uh, and I think now that we live in a digitized world, it's also important to know where the policies are archived uh, in, an, in an institution, uh, whether there's a repository somewhere. So, so for continuity, in case the people that develop the policies are no longer within the institution. Thank you very much. Wow, oh, excellent, I, I like that. I think it's also important, and I don't know if we've touched upon that one, to clearly define you know the roles and responsibilities of each and everyone involved you know what should i as a lecturer be doing from this policy i think that's also very important um great you know many many um policies are subdivided and they can have uh, a part on for example management and organizational issues they could have a part on teaching staff so academics and definitely a part on, on students. Um, like Nicola is also saying in the chat, staff capacity, where people can get support for what, um, all that is very important. There's an interesting question from Dibungo about the difference between blended learning and a flipped classroom. All right, a flipped classroom is a strategy. Uh, it's it's, it's a, 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 a method, it's a teaching method that can be part of blended learning. What happens in a flipped classroom, basically, um, you give, as a lecturer, you give your students uh, content or activities, and then when you see them in your classroom, whether it's a face-to-face -face or a virtual one or an online one, then you discuss issues that come from what they have read. So it's basically just flipping what we used to do in a traditional uh, classroom. Great, yes, it's one approach to blend it. It's one example of, it, it's, a, it's, it's a, a strategy if you want. Great, on, on the slide that we have in front of us, we have something very important, which is called policy harmonization. Um, what do we mean by that, um, Nicola? Actually, I'm going to throw the ball to Nodumo. All right. <laughs> I, all right. I know this is her forte. Over to you, Nodumo. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, policy harmonization is a deliberate effort to ensure that a particular policy speaks to existing policies. Um, for example, with the blended learning policy, you'd find that universities or institutions already have a an ICT policy to address infrastructure issues. Maybe the university could also have a strategic plan or it could have a code of conduct for staff and students. So if there's an issue which relates to code of conduct within the blended learning policy, it must not conflict with what is in the university code of conduct. So it's, it's creating an environment where the policies speak to each other and they are well coordinated and they work like one system. 
So it means that uh, within an institution, it's important to have a policy, a person who is in charge of these policies so that the, whenever a new policy comes up, it does not contradict uh, existing policies or if there's a need to change the existing policies because things would have changed, it's a new year, it's a new decade, then those other older policies are also reviewed and upgraded. Thank you very much, Karen. Lovely, lovely, lovely. I, I, I like, you know, all the different points of view that are coming in and also in the chat room, it's actually very lively there. Um, Wayneant is asking us whether there is a comprehensive list of authoritative definitions, um, something that would be nationally or even internationally accepted. Um, I think that's a, a very good point. Um, and and, and um, if any of us have uh, maybe a link or maybe a, a resource we can point at, um, I think there are very good definitions that are um, used by international organizations such like the Commonwealth of Learning, but there must be others available as well. Um, and, and I'm sure maybe, you know, the colleagues will later come in and, and, and talk um, to us about that. Um, then Gutema is asking, uh, can we say blended learning? All right, um, blended learning. Okay, I suppose the question is whether blended learning is a mix of online and face-to-face -face learning. Um, I think that is something that, that um, needs to be qualified. I think um, uh, also Nicola is giving an example of the OLC that has uh, definitions, but again, there are some issues there, of course. Um, People sometimes interchangeably use hybrid and blended, but for some people these might have different meanings altogether. So it's very important that at least within your institution, you have a common understanding and a policy is one way to make sure of that. So a definition section in a policy is essential, I think. Um, if Nicola or Nodumo don't have anything to add to this at this moment, then um, maybe I can share a little bit about how we did it at the University of Eswatini. And then I'm asking, yes, thank you, Irene. Great. Okay, so our policies in general are initiated by a small committee, which is ad hoc, or it could even be an individual um, that has noticed a gap in policy or something that needs to be regulated and then comes up with a proposal. Uh, then that draft uh, goes to a faculty board or an institutional board and is discussed. Uh, there might be amendments to the draft and once it is accepted there, it is taken to the uh, overall university senate. Uh, senate. Senate then discusses the draft sends it back to all the faculties now, all the institutes. And again, discussions happen. Uh, people make suggestions for improvement. And then finally, a final draft gets again to Senate. If that is approved, it goes to council. And that is our highest decision-making instance. Uh, unfortunately, that is an instance that doesn't meet very often. So sometimes we have quite a number of policies waiting to be approved. And I think our blended learning one is an example of that. We have draft H, so you can already imagine how many steps we went through. Draft H is from April 2020 and we are deliberating it. But we're hoping that it will soon be sorted out because there were some issues that cannot move if we uh, don't have you know, a common voice on, on it. Um, if we go to the next slide, I just want to give you an idea and, and I'm, I've taken an excerpt from Ball, 1998, it's quite old already, uh, just to give you an idea of 
the feeling I get when I look at what we are doing in the university when it comes to our policy, specifically the blended learning one. And Ball, uh, he was talking about national policies, but it applies to, you know, institutional ones as well. He said that policy making is inevitably a process of bricolage, a matter of borrowing and copying bits and pieces of ideas from elsewhere drawing upon and amending locally tried and tested approaches, cannibalizing theories, research, trends and fashions, and not infrequently flailing around for anything at all that looks as though it might work. I think you get the feeling. Yeah, we, we have ideas we want to express, but we're not sure how to express them. So we're going to look at what the neighbor does. When the neighbor has something, we take it from the neighbor and then we put it there. But then that makes it very difficult to have uh, a coherent policy. So that's why the same author continues to say that most policies are ramshackle, compromise, hit and miss affairs. They are reworked, tinkered with, nuanced and inflected through complex processes of influence, text production, dissemination, and ultimately recreation in context of practice. And I think that's what Nicola was saying earlier. Policies are very contextual and they should be because they are trying to answer um, matters that are related to a local situation even though you know they talk to or they speak to what happens nationally and even continentally and internationally. My last slide on the University of Eswatini, um, Irene, talks about uh, the contents. We've spoken about what should appear in a blended learning policy. And so ours here, that draft H, has an introduction, a scope, where in that point two, it also talks about related policy, uh, policies rather, then the rush, rationale, the justification, why are we having this policy? Section four has those all important definitions. The intention is uh, stated in policy in, in section five, together with standards and requirement in six. We spoke about roles and responsibilities. That's our section seven. A schedule of implementation is very useful. And then also how to make sure that all staff is aware of what is going on. That is an important point. And because we have a draft H, it's also good to have the history of how the document got to be what it is. All right, so that's what happens at the University of Eswatini. I would now like to invite Nicola to tell us a little bit on what happened or what happens at Rhodes University. And I see you have an online education policy. Nicola, over to you. Thank you, Karen. So we borrowed from the neighbors. <laughs> you know, we saw, you know, UCT is calling this online education policy. They've got a broader um, policy. They don't have, you know, there's not separate ones for online learning and another one for blended learning. So yeah, it helps to look at what the neighbors are doing. Um, my role and, you know, my colleagues, uh, Neil and our HOD, Joanne Forster, we were asked by the quality, our quality unit um, to assist in developing this policy. And the main reason I think was because of some of the terminology and what drove the policy development was not necessarily blended learning. It was more the accreditation of online programs and courses where to get accreditation, people actually, you know, we have a national um, you know, council on higher education and um, Department of Higher Education and Training where you know you actually need to have this policy in place before programs can be accredited as online and they actually go through an accreditations process. All right, 
So Rhodes is a traditional face-to-face -face research intensive university that's located, as I mentioned, in Eastern Cape. And yeah, so we were developing these, I think because it's such a, it's quite remote, it's the only university, it's research intensive, not located in a city. Um, it was important to be a little bit, you know, be more, make offerings more flexible. So therefore, you know, it was mainly people in the postgraduate space designing offerings for online formats. Um, so what this policy includes, as mentioned, it includes the blended and the online. It has got guidelines for blended learning at undergraduate level, um, but it also has stuff um, pertaining to postgraduate. Um, so at Rhodes, the quality is actually ensured quality processes are ensured by the Institutional Research Planning and Quality Promotion Unit. And many of the policies related to teaching and learning are actually formulated in collaboration uh, with the Teaching and Learning Center, which is where I'm based. So at Rhodes, this is an uh, academic department. It's the Center for Higher Educational Research, Teaching and Learning. And the Educational Technology Team, which is myself and Neil, are located within this um, department. So yeah, I think it, it took quite a while, very similar processes to what Karen mentioned, how you know, it went to faculty for inputs and we then you know, made changes. I think it went back to faculty again and then to Senate. Neil, <laughs> I'm, and I, even up to how long did it take? I think we started last year and it was only really, I mean, it can, it can take, it took about, I think the whole time since you started roughly, Neil, so about a year. I think yeah, it was, year. About, it was about a year. It actually started before I was there. Um, we just had to try it up. Oh, yes, true. Um, yeah, so I think it was about a year because it was passed through Senate um, just just in the middle of lockdown, right? Or just in the beginning of lockdown. So, so it's about three months old. Yeah, gosh, <laughs> it's very hard sometimes for us to think time-wise. Thanks, Neil. So always checking. Um, but yeah, I think ours wasn't. It wasn't a response to to COVID. Um, it was something that was a long time coming. And I think it's just important to mention, as, as we talked about collaboration and inputs, and those are the kinds of things that are important and I think take takes a lot of time. Um, so, yeah, and then we also looked at policies, again, looking at the neighbors, uh, fellow research intensive universities, and also we looked at our national guidelines developed by D8 and the CHE because as we said, policies don't exist in a vacuum. You've got to look at what other universities are doing um, and you've got to refer and link to those in your policy as well as other going back to policy harmonization, linking to other policies like assessment and curriculum development um, and the processes for curriculum review, all those kinds of things. Um, yeah. So there's actually a lot to it, and I think it takes a lot of time. I think I'm going to hand over to Noduma. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Irene, if you could uh, move the slides. Um, I, I think it's uh, Karen, would you like to take this uh, part? Sure, sure, no, Dumo, mm. sure, sure. Mm. I, I think Nicola was already getting excited, you know, for <laughs> you to talk about the AAU policies, but we'll have to wait mm. a little bit longer, I think. Yeah, let us yeah. also just think a little bit about policy implementation. Um, okay, at, at my university, we, we have a policy that is almost there, but of course, part of it has already been implemented or is being implemented. Um, Nicola, I suppose the same is happening with you. Implementation, let's say we can call implementation ongoing. Now, what are some of the issues that um, 
the three of us and, and, and Irene and everybody that is participating here today, what are some of the issues that we've seen with policy implementation? Because, and I want to quote uh, McCaffrey, uh, that's a 2010 uh, resource. Um, he's, he, he or she, actually, I don't know, I should check that. But anyway, this researcher said that something, uh, that a policy can make sense on paper, but putting it into practice is quite a different thing altogether. So what are your thoughts and uh, ideas about that? And I can see Tabisa is saying um, that um, she was working on an e-learning strategy, but not a policy. Ah, all right. So the issue would be, how do these work together? Um, how does a strategy or a strategic document work with a policy document? Okay, from my point of view, a strategy document is a much larger document, uh, looks at the vision of a university or a workplace, and the policies are small elements that assist in getting to the strategy, assist in making the strategy reach its objectives. Um, I, I don't know if that's answering your your. I, your, your thought, Tabisa, but uh, I'm sure my, my colleagues will also come back to it. But uh, mm -hmm. I also want us to think a little bit more on this policy implementation. Oh, and I can see, Neto is saying that a strategy precedes policies. Indeed, indeed. The, policy, the policies follow the strategy. They are um, kind of results or consequences of a strategy. Um, I think that that's that's a very good way to put it. Um, yes, Nicola, you have a strategy. Even here at my university, the University of Eswatini, we have a strategy, a strategic plan, which you know in many cases are five-year plans. They can be ten-year plans. So it's long-term planning, and then we have the policies afterwards. Great, 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 great. Okay, policy implementation. Any any issues? Um, okay, maybe, maybe one issue that I can think about is that um, they, there can be some form of um, this juncture between the policy, something that is on paper, and things that are happening in real life. So events can be overtaking policy. You see, like we were talking about the COVID-19, we might have had policies in place, but COVID-19 took us by surprise, and now we need to tweak our policies because things have radically changed. Um, maybe, Nicola, you want to say something about implementation? Is it going well at, uh, at Rhodes University? Well, I guess with every university and now with the emergency remote teaching, it's a difficult question to be asking. Um, but I think we're definitely seeing gaps and gaps that were probably there before. I think the pandemic's really highlighted and amplified some. Um, I mean, even within our own team, uh, we see staff capacity um, as something that needs to grow um, quite, quite very importantly. Um, yeah, I guess that how the link between strategies and policies and when do you have what, um, it's, I think it's quite contextual. We had an educational technology strategy before we had a policy. Um, that was when, when I got to Rhodes and it was felt more like values on how, you know, the values are guiding a particular approach. So one of the things, for example, in, in our strategy was around uh, inequality, for example, um, and access. And I'm not sure to what extent um, that is also in the policy. The policy is more, I think, because sometimes, you know, there are things that actually need to be in place. And one of these, for example, is how um, even people doing short courses now actually need to have a student number and they need access to the libraries. You know, they're not second class citizens um, anymore. 
they're actually, you know, also not only the infrastructure of the university has to be more broadly accessible online for people who are taking online programs, right? So, yeah, it's, it's sort of like driving that then that's the next step of what will need to happen is that there will need to be, you know, different, you know, registration processes and things for these people to actually have proper student IDs and access. So, yeah, I mean, that's just one example around enabling access that, that I've seen crop up. Not sure if that answers your question, um, expands on what you were asking, Karen. Yeah, definitely, definitely, Nicola. And, and, and I think you've already introduced the next slide because, you know, when, when we think of all these things that, you know, have cropped up, all these new matters, all these um, questions of social justice and access and uh, connectivity, then that's when, you know, even if we have policies in, existing, in existence, rather, that's when we should be reviewing the policies we have. And, and so um, we evaluate what has happened during implementation, and then we look at how we can uh, bring about a, a policy that is improved, that, is, that responds better to the new situation. So policy review works hand in hand with a number of questions that we ask when we look at existing policies. For example, has the policy been implemented or is it still sitting on someone's shelf or in someone's drawer? Have the objectives been met? Have the outcomes resulted in what we wanted them to be? Um, does the policy reflect current good practice or have events overtaking the, overtaken the policy so much that we really need to do something new? So basically the question is, does the policy work? And that's a very, very important question. And that's a question that each institution must look at um, independently, but let's not forget also by looking at what the neighbors are doing because the neighbors might be doing something useful that we can learn from. So that's always good, peeping at what the neighbors do. And um, this brings me to the point where I would now like to go and peep to what our big brother, the AAU, is doing. So over to you, Nodumo. Please talk us a little bit on what your office deals with and how you can assist us. <laughs> okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Nicola. And thank you for the wonderful uh, uh, audience. So, um, the Association of African Universities is the implementing arm for the African Union Commission when it comes to issues related to African higher education. Uh, we consider the African Union Commission as our mother body in terms of policy guidance. Uh, Pre-COVID, there were some policies that had already been developed and uh, I would like to refer to two particular ones. Uh, the first one is the African Union Commission and uh, European Union, Union Commission inspired uh, African standards and guidelines for quality assurance. So these uh, standards and guidelines uh, look at the university broadly or they look at a national council for quality assurance broadly and uh, then there are some standards there that relate to what we are speaking about today in terms of the blended uh, learning so there's a standard on uh, teaching and learning there's also a standard on infrastructure uh, later on within the, this presentation, I'm sure it will be shared, 
you'd have access to to the links to see uh, the African standards and guidelines policy. So it also aims to guide countries and national councils for higher education pertaining to what they call uh, open distance learning or remote learning or blended learning. It, it depends also uh, on the terminology. And uh, there's also the African Council for Distance Education. It has also done some work to guide uh, open distance learning and uh, then how we can actually teach students that are not necessarily present uh, within the campuses. We also noted that uh, during COVID, there are some policies that have come up which were influenced by the pandemic. Uh, the African Union Commission itself issued policy guidelines on digitizing teaching and learning in Africa. Uh, UNESCO also provided or offered 10 recommendations for planning distance learning solutions. We saw the World Bank also offering guidance on remote learning. Uh, OECD also issued a framework to guide the education's response to COVID. So there the, the are policies at that continental level which we are developed for countries and also developed for further uptake by institutions. Please uh, go to the next slide, uh, Irene. Um, I would particularly wanted you to see the African standards and guidelines, for example, part A. Part A of this standard covers quite a lot. There are three standards, part A, part B, and part C. And in this one, you'd be interested in infrastructure and facilities, which is standard five and uh, standard eight on teaching and learning and maybe information management, but all of the standards are equally important. Irene, can we go to the next slide? And um, as an association, we're also promoting a benchmarking mechanism this uh, African quality rating mechanism aims to review and benchmark what institutions are doing. Are they doing quality higher education and how do they determine quality and how do they measure quality, whether it's in teaching and learning, whether it's in your blended learning programs. So what this uh, rating mechanism does uh, there's a section for institutional information, then there's a section for self-rating the, of the institution focusing on governance, focusing on teaching and learning, focusing on engagement with the community, etc. And then the last standard focuses on maybe three programs that the university would like to benchmark. And concerning this AQRIM, uh, before the year end, we should be issuing a call to universities who are interested in uh, completing this benchmarking questionnaire. It's quite an elaborate questionnaire. After the, those universities complete it, then a process would be facilitated for them to be visited by experts to verify the information that the university would have put there. And then a benchmarking would be done of all the universities that would have participated. 
So uh, I think uh, for those of you who are coming from universities, you will need to look out for that uh, call uh, by the end of the year so that if your university is interested in being benchmarked, uh, you can then participate. Uh, Irene, if we could uh, proceed to the next slide. Um, I, I would like my colleagues to come in now, particularly Karen. If you have any questions for me pertaining what we are doing at a continental level, please type it uh, in the chat. Thank you. Great, Nodumo. I think you've given a wonderful overview, but, but there were still some questions, you know, people trying to find out what the AAU has done, you know, during the pandemic. And I think, you know, both Nicola and myself have said that there's so much you have done, you know, training, webinars, but I'm sure maybe you want to add on to that or give some details. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, we, we've done a lot, particularly in the area of advocacy. We focused on high level advocacy, talking to ministers of education, permanent secretaries, and uh, appealing to them that we use this uh, opportunity presented by COVID to address some of the long-standing challenges that we know or we've seen in our higher education sector. The biggest challenge, as you know, is infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure and connectedness or unconnectedness of uh, learners. We believe that uh, the governments are critical in ensuring that infrastructure in a country reaches the most vulnerable. So we are lobbying or advocating for investments to be made in last mile connections. We see that countries have internet access, yes, but those are kind of first mile, uh, they are in towns. We want to see the most remote villages also prioritized in, in terms of connected, connectedness. And of course, there's always the business value in connecting rural areas, but there are ways in which this could be done. Uh, for example, we see that uh, most of the investors need motivation also to be able to invest in rural areas. There's, there are also these uh, methods or ways of connecting called community networks. Uh, so, so there are options that uh, countries can follow, but we would like to see the government being at the forefront. Uh, we've also done quite a significant amount of training. Uh, I think people are familiar with our webinars and other things. So we found that uh, the community is ready to engage online. Before we used to be a physical event institution, all our events and training programs uh, required people to travel. So we are now being challenged, you know, to also really change the way that we engage the, the network. So thank you very much. Yeah, great, great. No, Dumo, it's just, you know, talking us through all the different things the AAU has done, you know, from high level advocacy, you know, to down on the ground issues, training people through webinars to virtual training workshops. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot that you as an institution, as an organization have been doing for, for this continent. And um, one of the participants is asking, what is then the role of the World Bank concerning African education? 
Um, I okay. don't know, Nojumo, if you want to give us a bit of insight. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So uh, we are working with the World Bank to invest in African higher education. So they are giving loans uh, to African countries so that African countries can invest in specific universities to improve research, uh, improve uh, partnering, resource mobilization, improve academic mobility. So there's a program called the Africa Centers of Excellence, where we now have about, um, I think, 77 centers of excellence in Africa. Uh, some are in East and Southern Africa, some are in West and Central. So the World Bank is, uh, has played a critical role in terms of uh, funding uh, education in Africa. And these loans have really helped us to train quite a number of masters and PhD students and uh, gotten our institutions to get some of their programs accredited internationally and also measure up in terms of the, their ranking. You will notice that also during this COVID pandemic, we have some of our leading universities participating in the research to find a cure for, for COVID. They've also been active in uh, developing or manufacturing uh, washing uh, stations, uh, in manufacturing uh, all the things required, you know, to handle COVID in Africa. We've seen a lot of innovations coming from universities uh, during the COVID. Thank you. Wonderful. I think we've, we've gotten a very good overview there. And I, I think, you know, some of our uh, chat participants are uh, saying that, yes, you are right. Cyber infrastructure is important and, and linking everyone is one of those ways uh, through which we can build uh, a, a better future for all of us. Um, I think we've almost come full circle. And uh, Nicola, do you want to tell us a little bit you know, how we got to get full circle on the policy issues. Yeah, I think it was nice to share our, uh, you know, policies and context and sort of how they came about and also insight into the process. Because as one of our participants mentioned, not everyone is involved in, you know, the, you know, writing of policies. And I think just coming back to this idea, I think it goes back to the purpose. Once you actually have a policy, it is also a commitment. And then you can actually, Hello. I mean, in our case, you can then advocate for things like, um, you know, more staff capacity, which we know is definitely an issue in many African universities. You know, you've got a very, very small team of educational technology people uh, supporting an entire, you know, university. So, yeah, I guess it's constantly, it's going back, but then also, you know, it's a con it enables, I think, a conversation uh, with management. So, yeah, that was just something I thought of, you know, might be useful to share. Um, that it also gives you, when you have that common understanding, um, also can have implications for change you might want to see uh, within an institution. Yeah, back to you. Indeed, Nicola, indeed. I think, you know, when, when we now look at, at the image that we have in front of us, um, I think, you know, we've gone through uh, policy writing, you know, having an issue, drafting a paper, getting it approved, implementing it, seeing what works, what doesn't work. That means monitoring and evaluating, you know, the implementation and the policy itself. And then we get back to reviewing. And all that is done at an institutional level. But of course, um, 
as we have on, on, on many occasions repeated, it has to be done if possible um, in agreement with what happens uh, around us, be it nationally, be it continentally, and be it um, even internationally. Okay, we've come to the last part, our last slide before you get some resources, which is a form of conclusion. But of course, policy matters are never, they are never ending. You know, we never get to the end. We always need to review and draft new policy. Um, and so the, the, the main conclusion is very brief actually that we know that policies and all the challenges that come with them are contextual, that there are many benefits that can be reaped through the use of policies, and that benchmarking, and you know, in, in, in popular parlance, we're going to say looking at your neighbor, benchmarking is really an opportunity uh, for us to review things. And as Nodumo has indicated, there is an, a continental exercise, continental activity ongoing. Um, it's an online benchmarking survey, which might lead then to a visit from the AAU to your institution to assist. And um, Nodumo has put a link uh, in the chat. And I can see that Paul is saying, um, that if we expect graduates to be digitally fluent, lecturers must first be literature, uh, literate, literate, digitally literate, and I can only be in agreement. So training, continuous training is very important. And that is something that can be put in a policy, you know, that all lecturers should be trained, retrained, you know, that we make sure that everybody is on the same page when it comes to these issues. Um, I think Irene, and I hope your knocking in your office has stopped. I would like to hand over to you now. Irene. And, uh, hi, Karen, thank you so much. Unfortunately, the knocking is still going on. It's, it's not as loud as it was, and I would really, really want some feedback. I have shared a, a, a link for feedback from everybody who joined us, and I would like us to give the three ladies a big clap. Uh, Professor Karen Ferreira, Mayors, uh, Nadumo Dlamini, and Dr. Nicola uh, Pallet. We appreciate you. We thank you. And we can continue a little bit with a few questions, I think, as, as, as people fill in the, 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 the uh, feedback form, please. So, uh, because my knocking is still going, I will go back to my muted uh, situation. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I think we can take a few more questions, I think. Great. I mean, for the moment, I can only see well done and thank yous in the chat, which is very nice, of course, but we are here, the three of us are here for some questions or some comments. You know, we would really like to, to hear, are there other issues related to policy that, you know, you would like us to discuss today or perhaps, you know, in another session? Please do get in touch with us. Right. Okay. I can not see any further questions. Uh, please do fill in that form, that feedback form that Irene has shared. Go and look at all the resources. Um, the slides have been shared. You know, at the end of the slides, you will find, you know, some references, some resources, some links. Um, that you can find useful uh, in your ongoing policy development, policy review, whatever. Nicola, over to you. Thank you, Karen. And I want to just start by saying thank you to my fellow presenters, Karen and Nodumo, and also and Irene for facilitating. Um, I think one thing to remember is that policies are very contextual 
Um, you know, you can't just cut and paste from another university. You've kind of got to make it yours and get people to give input and think of it as a collaborative activity within your university. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's also exciting. I've seen quite a number of people who have joined the slide, so that's that's a good one. Yes, just click on the link and and join the slides, and you can get all the resources that Nicola talked about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think it's been great. Uh, my closing uh, remarks. I think I'll emphasize the need for these policies, and it mustn't just be about getting it done and displayed, but I think the policies give us an opportunity to reflect, to improve, to refocus, and to also learn uh, during the process. So thank you very much. All right, there's one question that came in, but I think we're going to go with it because it's a major one that needs, you know, really, really in-depth thinking and discussion. And the question is, what is a good educational policy during the pandemic? So I think maybe Irene can organize another webinar on that topic because that's a major one. <laughs> and should there be one? is another big question because policies are often something that you design for longer term um so yeah you might have a strategy instead of a policy mm. food for thought mm. right i think we're gonna close for today and um on behalf of irene the team of presenters, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your interaction and hope to see you all soon. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you.